Every single peace deal that has been proposed by Israel or anyone else has been rejected by the Arabs. Israel's always wanted peace with the Arabs. The Arabs have never wanted peace. But you've come here, kicked people out, occupied the land, and then wanted to do peace negotiation. This is like, you know, this is like certain people go to, come to Australia, for this use Australia. They come to New South Wales, take a land, push the people out, and they go, let's have peace negotiations. We get 50%, you get 50%. We get 41%, you get 70 What? Why would anyone accept that? Uh, let's use a contemporary example. Russia's invaded Ukraine. Now they've occupied certain parts of it. Let's say they end up occupying half of Ukraine, for example, hypothetically. Would it then be fine to then let's start, start new negotiations, how much Russia gets and how much Ukraine gets? And then if people start saying Russia has a right to exist, the Russian, that, in that part in, of Ukraine, am I wrong to push back on that? No, it's an occupation. Israel is an occupation force that, that was established by forcibly dispossessing people, many of whom still have the keys to their homes. How about your response? So the first thing that happens in that video, actually, if I've understood it correctly, and I want to be fair, but what I'm understanding he's saying is he's agreeing with Ben Shapiro that it's the Arabs who've always rejected peace with Israel. He's just justifying it. He's saying it's the right thing to reject that peace because of the analogies with Russia or, or, or people coming to New South Wales or whatever it is. And therefore, the right response is war. Right? That was Ben Shapiro's point. That's what that side wants. I think he wants it now. The war to destroy Israel, I don't know what his plan is, but presumably he wants people like Hamas or whoever it is to succeed in completely destroying Israel. I hope he doesn't want 9 million Jews to be killed, although that's pretty much the inevitable consequence of such a, a war, which is what they're always speaking about. But let's judge him favorably. Maybe he's got some other plan for some miraculous way in which these Jews will just, uh, I don't know what, who knows what will happen to them. But yes, he's saying we want war, not peace, and that's justified. So now let's get into the core of his argument, because it is a pretty horrific position to be holding on to. But it is the position of Hamas, and it has been the position of the Palestinian leadership consistently since before the state of Israel even started, right? since before 1948. And we'll come to that in a minute. But let's look at the analogy to Russia moving into Ukraine or, or white settlers coming into New South Wales. They're people who already have a country in which they're all established as citizens and they move somewhere else in the world to dominate and control it. The Jewish people are absolutely not like that. The Jewish people are the indigenous population land of Israel who were thrown out 2000 years ago, who have always been in a state of perpetual protest, who've always been saying our only home is Israel. We want to return. They didn't have the ability to return under a lot of Christian and Muslim control. And also with the technologies that were available at the time, travel was incredibly dangerous. Most people lived in the village they were in almost their whole life. The agriculture, the land was very limited in what it could support and Jews couldn't return that. And when they got the chance to finally pick up and go back to the only place we've ever been able to call home, the only home we've ever had, an indigenous population coming back home, the settlement was almost all exclusively out of the friction areas of the Arab population. Apart from Jerusalem, where there was already a strong Jewish majority by the time the British even came in, right? In most areas, they were settling Tel Aviv. Further south was Jaffa, the Jaffa port, where the Arabs were. The Jews were settling in Tel Aviv, in Herzliya, in Netanya, in Petah Tikva, in all these areas, draining swamps, buying the land absolutely legally and settling it. Almost always empty land. Not that there weren't Arabs in other parts of the land, there were. Right. Some people like to over-exaggerate, there were no Arabs, that's not true. There were Arab populations there in Jenin, in, Shech in Nablus, in, in all these sorts of areas. But the Jews were buying up land from the landlords under the Ottoman Empire and settling new communities there, returning home. Yes, the local Arabs also have a right to the land. And I think this whole idea that it's only one side ever has the right to land is not true. Both sides can have a right to the land. And that's where the partition plans came in, let's divide the land. What stopped it was not a single Arab losing their home. It, that happened in 1948, because of the 1948 war to try to destroy Israel. And as Israel counterattacked and the Arabs fled their homes, that's what happened. But in terms of the war to destroy the Jewish settlement of Israel, that starts in 1920s. Haj al-Amin Husseini, the Mufti of Jerusalem, decides for religious reasons that we cannot possibly have in the Dar al-Islam, in the middle of Islamic lands in the Middle East, historic Islamic lands, we cannot have a non-Muslim entity ruling. It has to be destroyed. And that begins the riots and the pogrom destroying Jewish communities in Israel 28 years before there's even a state of Israel. And that's why even in the run up to Israel, every time there was an offer of let's divide the land, both sides have a claim to the land, right? There hasn't been an independent country in this land for millennia. 
since the Jews were here. There's been empires, but now we're going to break it into countries and create new borders and boundaries. So let's put a border where there's an Arab majority, let's put a border where there's a Jewish majority, and there's going to be a lot of Jewish immigration coming in. And that's fact. And the answer was no before a single Arab was even out of their homes. No to the Peel Commission, no to the 1947 partition, partition plan, no to the 1948 two-state solution, which Israel, the Jewish population, accepted. No, after the 1967 war with the Khartoum Conference, no peace, no recognition, no negotiation, no at the end of the Oslo Accord negotiations, no when Ayyad Omet offered, uh, offered Mahmoud Abbas, no, no, no. And as this particular uh, video also says, no peace, the war to destroy the settlement of Jews, as they would call it, in the Dar al Islam. That's really what it's about the war to destroy Israel. And that's what people don't realize. What Hamas are doing is a continuation of this hundred years war to destroy Israel. Ali, I want to say this. Do you think I don't cry when we, when we see and hear Palestinian deaths? I'm sure you do too, right? We, we don't want to see Palestinians dying. We don't want to see Palestinians stuck in refugee camps. We don't want occupation. Most Israelis don't want it and would willingly give it up if they thought there could be peace. But somebody in that world has to take leadership and not like that video and say, you know what? We might both have claims to the whole land. We're not both going to get the whole land. Let's divide and live in peace with each other. And let's stop making videos just like the war to destroy Israel and its 9 million Jewish citizens. Absolutely. And I think the, the thing that a lot of people don't appreciate is, I think there's, there's this misconception that somehow Jewish people sort of en masse in the early 20th century just came in and displaced and conquered this territory and, you know, just by force without any you know seeking some kind of agreement or whatever and the people don't understand the displacement occurred because b b because the arabs refused to accept a partition plan without there didn't need to be any displacement whatsoever all the land was purchased legally and it was just the question of what do we now do with these two um two communities um and especially given that as you say there was once a Jew jewish sovereignty there which jewish people have been protesting against ever since they were um exiled and uh, but there never was a palestinian uh, sovereign uh, state there but um, okay, you want you know you want to have some kind of state. Okay, so let's 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 make a make a deal work here for for both of us. And it's it's so clear to me that any objective uh, person that looks at history can see that there really has been a moral a qualitative moral difference between the Jewish side and the Arab side in terms of um, seeking peace and uh, an arrangement that uh, could could work for everyone. Yeah, I, I push back on one or two points, or at least raise question about one or two points. One is, yes, there was no Arab state before, but there were Arab people there before, right? And, and as uh, the empires break into nationalism, you know, as much as the Jordanians and the Iraqis, all these new countries that were going to be created, there's no good reason why there couldn't also be Palestinian Arab states. So, uh, you know, I think we have to be I fair. Wasn't, I, wasn't, I wasn't challenging that. I, I, I just simply say, I'm simply saying that if one, if one thinks... Saying, well, yeah, I, I understand what I'm saying. But the other point, which I'll, I'll also push back in a different direction, is yeah. that you know the 1948 war on the refugees it's a we used to learn a narrative and palestinian kids learn a narrative and that neither one's 100 percent correct we used to learn as children that they left because the syrian high command told them to evacuate and leave so they could create a killing field to kill jews and most palestinian kids that i've spoken to palestinian adults i don't usually speak to the kids because uh, i have been involved in discussion forums um they learned the story that israelis came at gunpoint and kicked them all out of their homes right and it took me quite a long time to understand both sides sincerely believe that story, but the actual story is something that's not quite either. There are instances yeah. of both. There were communities where Israelis came in, usually when they were surrounding, the village was surrounding a Jewish village and there was no way to save it without, without evacuating the Palestinians from there. But there were tiny numbers. There were tiny numbers who left voluntarily. Benny Morris has chronicled the most detailed chronicling of exactly what happened village by village, is the Israelis will come close, the local Arabs were convinced they were coming to kill them, even though anyone who stayed ended up being able to be absorbed as a peaceful, equal citizen. They got up and fled. In their mind, the Israelis kicked them out. When the Israelis turned up, they saw they'd gone. In their mind, it was the Syrian high command. Now, that doesn't diminish the tragedy, but it just shows an example how you can have two narratives of exactly the same event, and it means something yeah. so different. And that, I think, has been running all the way through the conflict. Yeah, yeah. And look, the, the reason why I brought up the issue of that there hasn't been a any previous Palestinian sovereignty or Palestinian state. The only reason I bring it up is because there's there's really two issues we're dealing with. There's one question of like specific land and who c can live where, and then an issue of sovereignty and who, you know, right to statehood. And so therefore it's important to have the context of 
there's well one question of land and as you said there wasn't displacement until there was a war to try and annihilate a state but then that brings up the question of okay well who has the right to claim when it comes to sovereignty here and i think the context of if let's say there wasn't a jewish uh, connection to that land prior and jewish sovereignty there prior then the the the, the claim may be more challenging um and so too, therefore, it's important to take note as context that there there wasn't a Palestinian sovereignty there prior. But there, as you say, also in terms of land, not sovereignty, but la living there, yes, there's been a very much an Arab community there. And so right. it's just about balancing that. I, I agree with it. And I actually think it's one of the most deep points in the conflict. People tend to believe if one side's got a right, the other one can't have it. And you've got, let's say, especially on the far left, this narrative of these, um, you know, this uh, colonialism coming in as if like the British were sending some British citizens to, to drag out all the resources of the land. You know, and that's a false narrative. I think it's a horrific comparison or like Russia going into Ukraine right now. This is the Jewish people coming to live in the land, not to take it anywhere else, coming home in the only place. And Jews have not been able to call anywhere else in the world home. Always been at best yeah. second class citizens anyway, you know, yeah. and finally come home. And the idea was not, no one's going to get kicked out and no one needed to be kicked out of anything anywhere. Had they, had they agreed to the peace? And in that video, he explains why they're not agreeing to the peace. All they want is the war to kick the Jews out. Yeah, but, but I do have to say, there is a big part of me that feels if the Palestinian leadership, even before, or let's say the Arab leadership, before there was a call, you know, a call for Palestinian nationalism, but let's say if it's always basically been hostile and it's been exterminationist in terms of Jewish sovereignty aspirations. And I, I can't really think of a leader that's ever been there that supported Jewish sovereignty. And we now see from polling that Hamas have 75 percent support. On the one hand, I hear the arguments that, yes, let's try and re-educate. Let's try and see if we can somehow change the culture. and We've got to keep extending our hand for peace. Another part of me says, one can only try that for so long. And I'm not saying that time has come yet where we have to stop. And one, and I think one can only give so many chances to another side in good faith before one has to say, we, we have to look at this look at this differently now because you, you, you're just not prepared to to accept um, the legitimacy of, uh, of Israel. Yeah, I have a different take on it. Maybe we'll make another video and talk about different, different positions on this. I think in terms of the reactions, reaction, what I believe is, look, it took the Jews 2,000 years to fulfill the dream of returning home, right? We prayed for it every single day. Every Jew prayed for it three times a day. Every single time we ate food, that was the main prayer we made is we want to go home. Um, we also pray for peace. And if we wait 2,000 years, we waited 2,000 years to return home. Hopefully, we don't need to wait 2,000 years for peace. But I, I don't give up on dreaming. Yes, you can't be naive. you got to know when you've got to defend yourself. But at the same time, I think... I think that is, I think there's people need to be empathetic with the pain of the other and really learn to hear the story the other one has to tell. Right? I think Israelis have to be unafraid to hear the trauma Palestinians have been through. The Palestinians and Arabs generally need to, uh, beyond uh, Israel, the Syrians and other Arab groups who want to destroy Israel, need to be able to hear the narration story of, of, of Israel and what Israel's been through, what the Jewish people have been through, and what it meant to come home. And then 20, 30, 40 years after starting resettling the land, getting these massacres trying to kill us and wipe us out, right? We need to hear each other's sides on it because there are two ways of narrating the same set of facts. And when we believe that if we're in pain, the other side is only evil, right? Right, then we diminish the pain and suffering they've been through, and we can't really understand where they're coming from. And I'm not justifying Hamas, that's a religious ideology to wipe the Jews out that has been there since at least the 1920s. That will have to be gone before there can be peace. But there has to also be a way that we can understand the trauma and suffering Palestinians have been through, and that they can understand the trauma and suffering Israelis and Jews have been through, the fears Israel has of giving, giving too much territorial concessions. That's my view. Um, I, 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 I do hear that, but I, th I just think there's sometimes a bit of a bigotry of low expectations sometimes that we might have where we say, well, you know, OK, you, you, you've, you've experienced something that you, you don't like and you have a narrative, but, there's, but, but that do I don't think that therefore means that you, I'm not saying you're saying this, but there's sometimes this sense that you always have, like, one almost has like a blank check to do whatever they want. And I'm saying when I keep seeing yeah. from the other side, even before Ezra's existence, the leadership, the people that constantly seem to rise to the top and seem to have a cultural support are it's are, are, are seeking something that I don't think is like, a, well, they've got it's their valid perspective here. 
then I, I, let yeah. me, I'm not being a radical pluralist and I'm not saying the two sides have been equal in the amount of violence, aggression and so on. I, I definitely agree with you. I think when you do line up all the events and the fact it's very clear, the main war has not been a war about whether Palestinians can have a land. The war has been about whether Jews can. And the yeah. war has been primarily a genocidal war to destroy the Jewish population of the land. Yeah. So I, I agree with you on that. I'm not making the two sides equal, but I am saying that it's not like the other side hasn't suffered. It's not like there's never been Jewish atrocities as well committed during all this time. It's not like there's never been things wrong. There have. Um, I think it's when we learn to hear the story of each side that we have the possibility of peace. So long as each one of us has convinced the other side of demons and evil people, it's much, much harder. I don't know if peace comes from one I think, one I, I think Israel has years been doing that. Whatever. What? I think I think I think Israel has been doing that. You know, they've basically the, the peace agreements they've tried to do and agreed to. I can't really see what more they've c could be could be doing. It's certainly I think Israel has definitely reached across much much more. I think Israel is consistent. I think even right now, where the majority of Israelis vote right wing, if they would be convinced, there would really be a side willing to accept them in peace properly. I think yeah. they would through what for many will be painful of withdrawing completely from or from most parts of the West Bank and land exchanges and all those old old deals and so on. I agree with you. Yeah, yeah. And I, I by the way, I certainly agree. Certainly, we, we, we absolutely, peace has to be a priority. The question is what that peace looks like.